My name is Zach. Uh, as Julie mentioned, I am a designer at Dropbox. I work on our design systems team. And one really cool side effect of working on uh, our design systems team is that I get to see a lot of the work that our designers do. And appropriate for tonight, I get to see a lot of the prototypes they make. Um, there's a trend that we've been seeing uh, at Dropbox in how people prototype. Um, this trend is that there are sort of two modes of prototyping that people get into. The first mode of prototyping is what I would call prototyping to understand. This mode of prototyping is, think of it as like your explorative prototyping. The designer sits down and cranks out dozens of prototypes, all trying to solve the same problem. Uh, often you're tweaking animations, details, curves, things like that. The audience for that type of prototyping tends to be yourself, maybe a teammate, but you're largely trying to figure something out. And then the second type of prototyping, which I don't think gets enough attention, is what we call prototyping to be understood. This type of prototyping looks like selling an idea or making kind of a single epic prototype that you're gonna to use to sell your company on a new vision. So I wanna to spend tonight, the next 10 or 15 minutes, talking about what these two types are and then how to use them effectively in your work. So let's start with this first style of prototyping. Prototyping to understand. The other day I was digging through a teammate's prototyping folder, actually Ryan Hassan, who's here tonight, um, and I was trying to steal a snippet of code from him to use in one of my projects. As I dug through his folders and looked at all the projects he's worked on, which is a lot, there was one folder that stood out to me. He was working on paper and looking for, to, to come up with kind of a new way to add tables into a paper doc. So when I dug into this single folder, I was expecting to find like maybe two or three prototypes, at most five, but I actually found a couple dozen unique prototypes, all looking at different ways to insert tables into a document. And I was like really blown away by how much work he poured into this kind of one idea of how do you insert a table into a doc. And the way Ryan works is he kind of prototypes for himself, exploring the same idea over and over and over again until he kind of narrows it down to one idea that he thinks works. And I think this style of prototyping is really common. We see this a lot on the internet, people posting kind of their, their sweet prototype that they made. It's like these micro interactions and these small details. And I started to ask myself, why does someone like Ryan uh, kind of prototype in this style? Why does he spend so much time trying to get the details right? And I think the answer for Ryan and for a lot of us is we prototype to understand. We're trying to not impress anyone else or convince anyone of anything. We're just trying to figure out the answer for ourselves. We, don't, we wanna know how this thing feels in our hands when we swipe. We wanna know what the perfect animation curve is or what the right design pattern is. But then the question becomes, what do you do once you've kind of fully understood a space? What do you do when you think, think you have the perfect solution? And that's where the second style of prototyping comes in. Prototyping to be understood. In the second mode, you kind of take that idea that you think really sells the idea or so solves the solution, um, and you shift into selling the idea. And so to kind of illustrate this side of prototyping, I want to tell a story of actually my first month at Dropbox. This is now three, four years ago. It's a little while back. Um, when I started, I sat next to a designer named Sam Zhao. And Sam was paired with me as my mentor and DFF, which at Dropbox stands for design friend forever. Um, yeah, so Sam and I both loved prototyping. We would often stay late into the night working on some little detail of a framework prototype. And I think at the time I was working on some new onboarding wizard. Um, Sam, on the other hand, was working on something a little more complex. This idea of a new shared folder is built around teams. And I'm not gonna lie, I didn't totally understand it. Um, he would often try to explain it to me in diagrams or he would like take me to a conference room and we'd whiteboard out uh, how this new shared folder works. And over time, he would just kind of get frustrated at like, why don't you understand this? Why does anyone understand this idea of a shared folder? It seems like it should just work. Uh, until one day, he messaged me and he said, hey, can you take a look at something? Um, so I came over to his computer screen and this is what I saw. Uh, this is now, again, three years ago, but this is the real prototype. And this prototype was a full recreation of the Mac desktop. Uh, you had like a whole folder structure. You could click through and open up uh, files. You could even, you'll see in a second, you can like turn off the Wi-Fi. And that's important, but um, 
Yeah, so it's like an epic, epic prototype. But something else happened. As I was clicking through this prototype and kind of geeking out on all the details that he had made, um, the idea of a shared folder built for teams finally clicked. This idea that for about a month now, he had been trying to explain to me through diagrams and sketch mockups and whiteboard sessions, finally just made sense. And so Sam took that single prototype, um, put it into a document, a paper doc, gave a nice little introduction to what this prototype was, what the idea was, and then shared that document out with our team, our design team at first, and then the rest of the company. And pretty soon, uh, it felt like everybody at Dropbox was clicking to this prototype, talking about this new shared folder for Teams. And about a year later, we actually launched that team folder project. Um, and my favorite part about this story is that still three, four years later, that prototype Sam made is still being used for onboarding. Uh, it's how we kind of explain to new hires how the team folder works. So the power of prototyping is that you can keep explaining the idea over and over again um, without you being in the room. So to recap, there's sort of two modes of prototyping that we have. There's the style that Ryan has, the prototyping to understand, where you're iterating an idea quickly, trying to figure out the right uh, solution to your problem. And then there's prototyping to be understood, where once you've sort of found that right fit, you're trying to sell it, get people to understand the idea the same way that you do. And so again, I don't think the second style of prototyping gets enough attention, so I wanted to kind of dig into it and talk about how it works, how to be effective with it. So a question people will ask is, how do you know when it's time to switch modes? How do you know when you've prototyped enough and you fully understand the problem and it's ready to start selling it? Well, I think there's three reasons that I've encountered that people need to switch modes. Um, the first is, you really need to simplify a complex solution. So if you're at a place working on an idea and in your head it just feels really simple, but every time you try to explain it to someone, maybe you're using uh, click prototypes or maybe you're diagramming something out, people don't quite get it. Um, prototyping can be a really effective way to kind of simplify something that seems super complex to others down into something that just makes sense. Uh, imagine if you're working at Twitter and you're a designer working on pull to refresh. This is their patent diagram. Um, and you use this to try to sell your team on pull to refresh as a concept. You probably get a lot of kind of blank stares, people doubting that a user would be able to figure out pull to refresh. But if instead you just said, hey, you know, here's a phone, here's a Twitter app, what do you think? Can you figure out how to refresh it? You probably get a much different reaction. And the idea of pull to refresh wouldn't seem like a complex idea, it would just seem like a natural gesture. Second reason to kind of switch modes is if you want to provoke a discussion. So if you're finding that people are ignoring your idea maybe, not treating it seriously, not imagining that this could actually happen one day, um, seeing an actual prototype can really change the discussion. So for that first month, Sam had tried to kind of convey this idea of a shared folder built for teams using diagrams or whiteboard sessions. And at most, I would kind of nod my head and be like, yeah, sure, makes sense. Um, but it wasn't enough to engage with them or give feedback. As soon as he switched gears and started prototyping, instantly the team was able to offer like real critical feedback. Um, for example, I mentioned the Wi-Fi thing and in the top right you could actually disable the Wi-Fi and that was important because uh, it played a role in how the uh, folder structure worked, whether you could access content or not. Um, and so it was details like this that allowed the team to, to not only say I get the idea, but offer feedback and kind of encourage. The last reason you might want to switch into this mode is if you want to spread an idea. When Sam made that prototype, he didn't stop by just sending a couple links around and saying, hey, check out this prototype. He actually used that to convey the message across the entire company. And soon, people everywhere were talking about this new style of folders and how this might be the future for Dropbox. So if you have an idea that you really want to start spreading out there, getting people to engage with, talk about, maybe even build on, uh, prototyping can be a really effective way uh, to start that conversation. So again, three reasons to switch into this mode of prototyping. If you want to simplify a complex solution, if you want to provoke a discussion, get people talking, and then lastly, if you're just trying to spread an idea, get as many people as possible in your company to see things the way you do. And I wanted to finish with four tips, four practical tips that I find really useful whenever I do switch into the second mode of prototyping. Um, the first is, as soon as you realize that you're going from kind of lots of little prototypes to one epic big prototype, it can be wise to take a step back 
and invest in a foundation. Um, often these prototypes can take weeks, if not months, to build out. Um, and so just taking a moment, if you're working in Framer, clean up your code, organize it. Um, personally, I love the design tab side of things, kind of visually laying out my space. This has the added benefit of other designers, engineers who want to hop in and start contributing. Uh, kind of being able to understand your space, how things work, uh, can be really, really beneficial. Second, cut corners as much as possible. So it's easy to forget when you're building these kind of larger prototypes that this is still just a prototype. Um, it's easy to think about it as like production code and you want to get every little detail right. Um, but the goal of a prototype is just to convey an idea, get people talking. And so uh, I always encourage people when starting out to start with a kit. There's usually, in Framer at least, uh, a kit for the platform you're working on or maybe even the idea you're iterating on. Um, so start there. And then another way that you can cut corners, and I mentioned this already, with the Wi-Fi piece that Sam prototyped, um, you might notice that it's not actually built in the same way that you would experience turning off the Wi-Fi on Mac. Uh, it's just a simple one click to disable the Wi-Fi, but most people when they played with the prototype didn't even notice that. So Sam saved himself probably a few hours having to prototype a drop down, <laughs> scroll down the list, click. That was all unnecessary. Um, so think about, kind of from your user's point of view, what actually is necessary to convey the idea. This next one I tend to forget, uh, but test that your prototype is usable. And I don't mean like usability testing of your actual idea. I mean that the prototype itself is usable. It's easy to forget after staring at a prototype for weeks um, that someone opening this up, up for the first time might really struggle to know what's clickable, what's not. Uh, imagine if in that prototype Sam had decided that, hey, to make a more realistic experience, uh, the finder window should be closed to start out. Well, chances are someone would open this up and spend a minute clicking around, trying to figure out what the hell actually works, and chances are close it before they actually got to clicking on the finder window. Um, so just a good tip here is like turn to a neighbor, turn to someone you trust, hand them the prototype, and without prompting them, just see what they click on, what works, what doesn't. Um, and if necessary, add some like guidance to the prototype, make it feel more like a walkthrough than to, uh, Click Adventure. And the fourth tip I'll give you guys is um, when you are ready to share, make sure you share your prototype with some context. Uh, I do this sometimes where I just make a prototype, get that little framer link, and send it off to someone over Slack. But then they're left wondering what's the point of this prototype. Uh, if they want to pass it on to someone else, it gets lost in translation. So again, what we do is we tend to make a document for us that's paper. We include a little introduction uh, describing what this prototype's purpose is. Uh, a really nice way to help people who are viewing this on their phone is to include a video, probably a GIF, uh, that walks them through the prototype. This helps people understand kind of the general purpose of the prototype, but also uh, if they're viewed on their phone, they don't have to worry about like, can their screen size fit the prototype? Is it performant? Um, so yeah, in summary, Four tips for y'all. Uh, invest in a foundation as soon as you know you're switching into this mode. Cut corners as much as possible. Test that your prototype is actually usable. And then lastly, when you are ready to share it, share it with some context. And I wanted to finish with one final story, and that's the story of the Dropbox redesign. A couple years ago, Ed Chow um, and his team started working on a redesign of the Dropbox.com product. When they started out, they used Framer, and they would prototype a lot of the micro interactions that would eventually make up the redesign. Things like, how do I transition between pages? How might a user switch from a work account into a personal account? And for each one of these design problems that they're trying to solve, Ed would make dozens of Framer prototypes, all exploring different ways to solve the same problem. When he and his team felt like they're at a good spot, and they had fully sort of understood the problem space, they switched modes, and they explicitly said that we are now going to be prototyping for uh, selling this idea, getting momentum across the company. And so what does it look like for them to switch into this prototyping to be understood mode? Well, one thing I did is he compiled all those smaller prototypes into one epic prototype, and that prototype kind of had a complete picture of what this redesign might look like. In the prototype, you could change pages, select and move content, search. It, under the hood, it was just a prototype, so just basic HTML, JavaScript, CSS. But 
to most people, when they opened it up, it felt like the real thing, and it felt like this was close to being the real product. And so just like Sam, they took that prototype, um, put that into a paper doc, included in there some introductions, some imagery. At the bottom, there was a section called Try It Yourself that had some GIFs so that people could kind of follow along on their phones, and then a link to view the prototype themselves. <coughs> Eventually, that document and that prototype got shared around the company. Designers everywhere were talking about this redesign as if it was kind of months away, even though it was still a year out. Um, people got really excited about it, and this prototype acted as a North Star for the team to really see what the redesign might be. Um, a little while later, what started out as just an idea and just as a prototype, eventually launched to the world, and I'm pretty confident in saying that without that prototype and without that process, Ed and his team wouldn't have been able to ship the redesign as quickly as they did. So, a final question for you all. I would ask, what ideas are you working on today that you've been exploring for a while, maybe you really believe in, maybe you want people to start engaging with, what ideas can you use prototyping to help the world understand? What idea is ultimately ready to be understood? Thanks.